Welcome to The Mushroom Show, the one place where you need to be if you want to stay on top of all the cool things happening in the world of mushrooms. My name is Tony Shield, this is episode 33, and in this episode we're going to be looking at the ever-changing fight between rule makers and mushroom dispensary operators, some interesting developments there. We're also going to be looking at a new study that shows psilocybin can change the way we process emotions, specifically our response to angry and fearful faces. And finally, we'll be kicking off a new segment about the great discovery and landmarks along the path of the mushroom revolution called Great Moments in Mushroom History. Starting with a mushroom that could be a critical factor in helping us become a multi-planetary species. So if you like mushrooms, if you like The Mushroom Show, please go ahead and hit that like button. It really helps the channel grow. And if you want to see future episodes of The Mushroom Show, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button as well. Let's jump into the show. On to our first segment. Now the ongoing battle between law enforcement and mushroom dispensaries seems to be a never-ending game of whack-a-mole. It's almost comical at this point, with stores popping up all over the place offering psilocybin products, law enforcement seemingly turning a blind eye, and then boom, all of a sudden they get raided and shut down before eventually opening up again. But just like mushrooms pushing through concrete if they're trying to grow through a sidewalk or something, the ongoing opening of these stores in clear violation of the law seems to be absolutely relentless. Trying to prevent these stores from opening is like trying to hold a beach ball underwater. You can do it for a certain period of time, but eventually it will just pop right back up. This became super obvious when I saw this article come across my feed, and it's about the recent capitulation of Vancouver City Council to reinstate the business license of the mushroom dispensary. And according to this article, making it the first store licensed to sell psilocybin mushrooms in Canada. Right from the article, it states, Vancouver City Councilors have voted to reissue the business license of a dispensary that has been selling mushrooms illegally, but openly since February 2023. A decision store operator Dan Larson described as cracking the door open for regulation of psilocybin in the city. Point of clarity here, a city granting a license to a business that is selling psilocybin products is not necessarily saying that it's legal because psilocybin is still federally illegal in Canada. This was a point that was highlighted by the mayor of Vancouver who posted a statement on X saying that he was extremely disappointed by the decision, following up that the sale of psilocybin products is not permitted by federal government. All business license holders are are obligated to adhere to both federal and provincial laws in addition to municipal regulations. So I'm not really sure what the license or the reissuing of the license really means. It seems like it just means like this particular business has a license to operate in the city of Vancouver. And a little more context to the story, Dana Larson, who is quoted in the article, actually operates three mushroom dispensaries in the city. And as recently as November 2023, all three of these stores were raided. They were temporarily shut down and Dana was arrested. So this is quite the turnaround in posturing by the city in a very short time. Dana also made headlines a short while later in early January 2024, when he sent samples of his mushrooms to British Columbia's MLAs, along with a letter asking them to reconsider their policies on mushrooms and other federally controlled substances. I'm not going to lie, I was still a little confused reading through this article because it does kind of focus on the reissuing of this business license, focusing on the fact that it is the first licensed psilocybin dispensary in Canada. But when you look at the two other stores operated by Dana in the same city, one is simply operating without a license, but the other one apparently had its business license approved in 2021. 2022, 2023, although it was denied this year in 2024. Either way, Dana is continuing to push forward with this idea of civil disobedience with the mushroom dispensaries, hoping that psilocybin will follow a similar path that cannabis did in the early knots, where these dispensaries were opening up in clear violation of the law, but eventually the substance became federally legal, and now you see legal dispensaries all over the country. This was highlighted by one of the Vancouver council members who voted to reinstate the license. On X, he said, there are dozens of shops in Vancouver providing safe supply to willing consumers. We saw this pattern in 2015 with cannabis and where City of Vancouver prioritized harm reduction and smart regulation over politics and prohibition. The future is going to be interesting indeed and I fully expect to see more and more of this start to show up in cities across the country and across North America. On to our next story. Now, some people might be angry about what's happening in Vancouver with psilocybin mushrooms, but their faces might not be interpreted as having an angry expression for those who are patronizing the store. This is according to some really interesting new research that shows psilocybin mushrooms might actually be able to weaken the brain's response to seeing angry faces. Now, I do find this pretty interesting
interesting because when you think about the way psilocybin mushrooms have been portrayed in the media over the years, you think about this summer of love and this kind of easygoing attitude. And without a doubt, these mushrooms, anecdotally at least, are associated with positive feelings about other people, introspection, and perhaps different ways you think about yourself and your place in the world and about the earth and the environment. Overall, just representing good vibes and perhaps scientists are starting to figure out why that is the case. Here is the recently published paper. It's titled Amygdala Response to Emotional Faces Following Acute Administration of Psilocybin in Healthy Individuals. And they mentioned a similar sentiment in the paper as I had by saying psilocybin can occasion emotions such as deep felt love and peacefulness, emotional breakthroughs, emotional acceptance rather than avoidance, increased emotional empathy, as well as re-experiencing of autobiographical emotional memories. Thus, from self-reports, it seems clear that psilocybin has a capacity to acutely change one's emotional state, but it remains unclear in what way psilocybin may modulate processing of emotions in the brain. But again, it's not often that you can actually prove that out with science, which is why I found this study really interesting. So here's what they did. They basically showed different faces. So angry faces, fearful faces, neutral faces, to a number of different participants while at baseline, in other words, just normal waking consciousness, and then under the influence of psilocybin or having taken a placebo. The paper says that the participants who received the psilocybin received about 0.2 to 0.3 milligrams per kilogram of synthetic psilocybin. So for a 150 pound person, for example, that would equate to about 14 to 16 milligrams of pure psilocybin, which if trying to match that to an equivalent dose of dried psilocybin cubensis, for example, which is approximately 1% psilocybin content somewhere in that neighborhood, it would be around one to two grams of dried mushrooms, which would be considered a relatively low dose if they were used for therapy or for recreation. They then measured the response of the amygdala, which is a part of the brain that is responsible for processing our feelings, specifically those around fear and anxiety. Now, regardless of being under the influence of psilocybin, everybody has a slightly different response to fear because of how their own amygdala operates. For example, I was recently watching a documentary on Alex Honnold. He's a free solo climber who climbed Yosemite's El Capitan without a rope. And they took a look at his amygdala to see what was going on. Remember, it's the fear center of the brain. And they realized it took a lot to activate his amygdala. Surprise, surprise. But most people who aren't free solo rock climbers or participate in extreme sports probably have an amygdala response that falls within a certain range. And according to this paper, that can be affected through psilocybin. So here are some of the results. This is an image of the brain scans of their participants. And the top frame is showing the amygdala response for the angry, fearful, and neutral faces at baseline. And the bottom frame here is showing the same emotional range of faces, but under the influence of psilocybin. You can clearly see that in particular, particular for the angry faces, the amygdala response is quite heightened at baseline, but with the intervention of psilocybin is very much so dampened, which the researchers found to be statistically significant. The response to the fearful faces was also dampened, and you can kind of see that in the scans, but this was found to be not statistically significant by the researchers. Interestingly, the response to neutral faces was actually increased, but again, it was found to be not statistically significant. Here is another way to look at it. This is the the line graph of the same response. And you can see the actual faces here. So you get an idea of the emotions that people were looking at. And you can see it decreased overall, most notably when looking at angry faces. They also tried to figure out if any of this was dose dependent. So measuring the amount of psilocybin in the blood and also the subjective drug intensity, or in other words, the self-reported intensity of the experiences against the same amygdala response. They noted that we found no evidence of a dose response effect of psilocybin levels on amygdala response to angry faces, fearful faces, or neutral faces. But they did see a significant correlation between the subjective intensity and the response to fearful faces, which you can see here in the chart. In other words, the participants had less of a negative response to fearful faces, the more intense their psilocybin experience was, which to be honest, seems kind of counterintuitive to me. You hear a lot of things about so-called bad trips, or at least how they might be portrayed in the movie, 
movies or on TV. And you would think that people experiencing higher levels of intensity while looking at weird faces or scary faces might have an increased fear response or an increased anxiety response to seeing those faces. But what this study might be suggesting is that that response is actually inverted, which is really interesting to me. So overall, is this study conclusive? And what does it really mean? I would say it's definitely really interesting. It's just another signpost along the road of trying to figure out how these things really work and what they do. And it could definitely have some implications around psilocybin therapy, which is typically used for things like anxiety. But it's obviously hard to draw any strong conclusions here. In the paper, the researchers noted that this is the first study to establish that psilocybin acutely modulates amygdala response to angry faces, and that amygdala response to fearful faces is associated with subjective drug intensity. Future studies should investigate whether emotion processing is altered in individuals with depression following acute administration of psilocybin, and whether such alterations are related to long-term therapeutic and clinical outcomes. Again, I think that's a really reasonable approach because a lot of these studies are focused around psilocybin therapy, how they can be used for depression and anxiety and PTSD and some other mental health conditions. So this is just another step towards understanding it. And maybe one day we'll actually be able to put all the pieces together. This episode of The Mushroom Show is brought to you by Fresh Cat Mushrooms, pure and powerful mushroom supplements to help you achieve your health goals. We are already well into 2024, believe it or not, and now might be the time to do a quick check-in on your New Year's resolutions. And if you haven't said any yet, it's not too late. Either way, whenever you're ready to fuel your well-being with the power of mushrooms, Fresh Cap is here for you. With pure and powerful mushroom extracts and powders made from whole mushroom fruiting body, thoroughly extracted and tested for active compounds, Fresh Cap is your number one choice for quality mushrooms. Choose from top functional mushrooms like lion's mane or turkey tail, or check out the ultimate mushroom complex, which is a blend of six popular functional mushrooms, including lion's mane, cordyceps, chaga, turkey tail, maitake, and reishi, available in both powder and capsule form. To get yours, head over to freshcap.com or search for Freshcap on Amazon. Let's get back to the show. On to our next segment. Now, I was recently having a conversation with somebody about how the interest in mushrooms or this kind of mushroom revolution seems to be coming in waves. So like, you know, one day there's a huge group of people that think mushrooms aren't that interesting and think they're just these things that you put on your pizza. And, you know, the next day that same group of people might be fascinated with a certain aspect of mushrooms or a certain aspect of mycology. There are these unique one-time exogenous as events that seem to break through the fold, they might get a lot of media exposure, and that brings in a whole new wave of mycophiles. I thought it would be fun to go through a history of the rise of mushrooms, cataloging the great events and the different ways that they are becoming more important in our everyday life. But there are way too many things to cover, definitely too many things for a single segment, so I thought instead I would do it more as a recurring segment, covering kind of one topic or one event at a time. I'm calling it Great Moments in History. And the first one I want to talk about is the discovery of radiation eating fungi and the potential implications it might have for our future as a multiplanetary species. It all started in 1986 with the famous Chernobyl nuclear disaster. It was a catastrophic explosion at the nuclear power plant which released massive amounts of radioactive material into the atmosphere, becoming one of the worst nuclear accidents in history. The immediate area was evacuated, leaving behind a desolate highly contaminated exclusion zone. But what does this have to do with mushrooms? Well, over time, the exclusion zone became a kind of unintended experiment into nature's resilience, specifically with fungi. Because in the years that followed the disaster, groups of researchers started to explore the exclusion zone, digging deeper and deeper, to try and figure out what, if anything, was able to grow there and what it might mean. And believe it or not, over that time, they found over 200 different species of fungi that were actually able to grow in that zone. Further research that was published in 1991 showed that some of these fungi were actually able to grow into and decompose so-called hot particles, pieces of graphite from destroyed reactors which were contaminated with radioactive matter. These fungi actually seem to enjoy being blasted with high doses of isotropic radiation. They also stood out for their dark, melanin-rich pigmentation. Now, these aren't large, fruiting-body-producing mushrooms. Don't picture giant mushrooms growing on the side of a nuclear reactor. 
larger. These are more akin to black mold. For example, one of the species that was found was Cloudosporium spirospermum. And it is not rare, it's found all over the world really. Commonly found as a type of black mold that's growing in old buildings and dilapidated bathroom walls. But the important thing to remember, again, is that these fungi are rich in the naturally occurring pigment known as melanin. I have mentioned before that chaga, which is a functional mushroom, also known as Inonotus obliquus, is also rich in melanin, which is why it looks the way it does with these kind of darkened bits on the outside. But melanin is also naturally found in human skin and in hair. But one of melanin's roles for humans, anyways, is to protect the skin from ultraviolet radiation, specifically from the radiation that comes from the sun. And it was the opinion of these researchers that melanin was also helping these fungi to be able to withstand the harsh conditions of the exclusion zone and protect them from the isotropic radiation that existed there. More research was done to try and confirm this, and the first thing that they established was the property of radiotropism. In other words, the fungi having the ability to perform radiosynthesis, using radiation as a source of energy to drive metabolism. So much like plants use light to produce energy via photosynthesis, which is much more well known, these fungi could possibly be using ionizing radiation from slowly decaying radioactive material to drive their metabolic processes. So this is quite a stunning hypothesis, quite a stunning discovery. And again, it's because of the melanin, but more specifically the way that the radiation changed the composition or the structure of the melanin that would actually encourage these fungi to grow faster. Even more interesting was that the closer these fungi were to the source of the radiation, the more melanin they had and the more they seemed to thrive. This meant that these fungi weren't merely adapting and barely able to survive in the exclusion zone. They were actually thriving because of it. So why is this such a great moment in mushroom history? Well, first of all, it's just really cool. We have known for a while that fungi can thrive in really weird places where other living things have a hard time, but to have something growing on literal nuclear waste brings that to a whole new level. But what's even cooler to me is that this discovery could also have implications for the future of humans as an interplanetary species. It seems like quite the stretch, but hear me out. One of the largest barriers to space travel is how we deal with the harsh conditions of space, particularly the radiation. It's really hard to find materials that can withstand that radiation, whether that be to build spacesuits or space stations. And even if we did have material that was able to withstand long periods of radiation exposure, it would likely be heavy and kind of impractical, especially if we want to use it to start building infrastructure on the moon or on Mars, for example. It would be so much easier if we could just grow it out in space or grow it on another planet. And that is what was argued in a 2020 paper titled Growth of the Radiotrophic Fungus Cladosporium spirospermum aboard the International Space Station and Effects of Ionizing Radiation. The paper talks about the potential importance of in situ resource utilization, or in other words, getting the stuff that we need from the place we are at. So for example, growing the stuff we need on another planet while we're there. It wonders if this fungi could be grown on Mars and if that could actually be utilized to protect the equipment or the people that are there. To test this theory, they actually sent some of this black mold fungi on petri dishes all the way to the International Space Station. They exposed the dishes to intense radiation, which had the fungi on one side of the plate and a control on the other. And what they found was that the fungus did in fact lower the penetrating radiation levels by about 2%, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it was based on a very thin 0.06 inch layer of fungus. The researchers extracted this number and compared it to typical radiation levels on Mars to postulate that a 21 centimeter thick layer of fungi could largely negate the annual dose equivalent of the radiation environment on the surface of Mars. So growing mushrooms on Mars might just be one of the first steps towards humans colonizing that planet. Talk about priorities. The researchers concluded the paper quite elegantly, tipping their hat to the wisdom of the fungi kingdom by saying, often nature has already developed surprisingly effective solutions to engineering and design problems faced as humankind evolves. Biotechnology could thus prove to be an invaluable asset for life support and protection of explorers on future missions to the moon, Mars, and beyond. My takeaway from all this, as with most things in mycotechnology, is that it's super cool to think about, it's super cool to think that mushrooms actually have this properties, it always makes 
makes me wonder like what else we're going to discover. But again, like most other things in microtechnology, it's pretty unlikely that we're gonna see them actually implemented anytime soon. But just because we probably won't be building spacesuits out of mushrooms anytime soon, it doesn't mean that there might not be other applications of this discovery. For example, potentially cleaning up nuclear waste on this planet. That would be a lot less surprising to see. And that's it for this episode of The Mushroom Show. Again, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for watching. And if you like mushrooms, if you like The Mushroom Show, please go ahead and hit that like button. It really helps the channel grow. And if you wanna see future episodes of the show, go ahead and hit that subscribe button as well. We'll see you in the next episode.